The first thing I wanted to say is that 1 Peter chapter 4 tells us that if anyone speaks, let them speak as if they're speaking the oracles of God. And so when we talk about methods of preaching, it's easy to, cra- to gravitate toward, well, what are the processes? What are the, the, the principles? What are the tools or the techniques? Uh, and there are a lot of paradigms out there. I think one of, the, one of the most popular paradigms right now is the one thought or one concept paradigm for preaching. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think when we talk about preaching, what we're really talking about is handling a supernatural power. And when we preach the gospel, when we preach the word of God, we need to understand that we're handling something that is um, that has been handed down to us over the last couple thousand years. We are recipients of this supernatural power, and how we handle that ought to make us, um, you know, it ought, it ought to cause us um, a pause. I remember the very first time I was going to preach at a church, I went about an hour early, and I was, um, this was back in... 1994, 1995, I went a little bit early. It was a small urban church in downtown Detroit. And I went a little bit early to pray and also to lay my hands on the pulpit. You know, the old timers used to call the pulpit the sacred desk. I love that language. So if you read Finney or Spurgeon or these other people who wrote uh, famous preachers, they would always refer to the, the pulpit as the sacred desk. And I remember laying my hands on the pulpit before I went to preach that first time, that first official sermon. I mean, I I was preaching long before that on campuses, but this was my first kind of big time. You know, I was going to be preaching in a church and I thought, you know, I, I I need to mark this moment. And so I went early, I laid my hands on the sacred desk and I said, God, as long as you will enable me to preach the word, uh, I pray that I would do so with great, great respect and awe for the craft and the art of preaching and great respect and awe for the word of God. And so I just wanted to say that because we're we're going to spend most of our time here today talking about our methods. Uh, I'm going to bounce back and forth from a couple of documents, and I hope that um, you all can see this. I'm also going to put a link to the Prezi uh, that I'll be using. So that's public, and you can use that for however you'd like. On your screens right now is a kind of a description of a process that I teach um, in our national speakers cohorts and other places that I do uh, preaching uh, training. And this is kind of a breakdown of how I spend my time. So every one message, it doesn't matter if it's a, I just got done speaking at a Q conference and that was a nine minute message. It doesn't matter if it's a 45 minute message, which is one of the messages we'll look at. Um, I'll show you my process. I recently preached at the Evangelical Covenant Church's denominational gathering in Chicago. Typically, my preparation process is about a 32-hour process. It doesn't necessarily have to be that for you, but as we go through some of these parts, you'll understand why um, I come up with some of those hours. So this is kind of a general guideline. As I'm going through my process, I'm praying, I'm uh, immersing myself in community, I'm dreaming about the message. And then if you look at the actual components, there's inductive study, the hermeneutical process, prophetic themes, iconic integration, which is what we're going to really kind of focus on today, sociocultural engagement, evangelistic elements, presentation format, practice, and delivery. And it's an an inverted pyramid because, as you can see, by the length of time I devote, that's really um, the the audience typically sees the last three. They're the ones who get exposed to, you know, the last three kind of layers of my my inverted pyramid but the vast majority of my time as a speaker i'm focusing on these kind of hidden parts on spending time in in prayer spending time immersed in the inductive study of the passage and so i want to just kind of say that most of us on the call are employees of intervarsity christian fellowship and we have a rich rich heritage of inductive bible study we just got down with urbana where we were immersed for an entire year before the conference in the scriptures. We were immersed on property in the scriptures. And most of that immersion was through inductive study. And by that, we typically mean observation, interpretation, application. But if you've been raised and reared in InterVarsity, you might not realize that there's a fourth letter that we almost never get to, and it's because we're primarily a trans with a lot of doctrinal theological distinctions, and that is S. So we have O I A. S, and the S stands for synthesis. So if you do any kind of biblical theology or uh, systematic theology, you understand that there are conclusions that we come to about specific passages 
only by understanding the entire corpus of scripture or a genre or say the Pauline epistles or those kinds of things that we bring a, a, a larger body of scripture to bear in terms of our interpretation on a specific passage. In some ways, I think university is handicapped by um, focusing so, um, how should I say, uh, so singularly on observation, interpretation, application, we never actually get to synthesis. And as communicators, that really is one of our main jobs, is to actually preach the text, but to do so in light of what the scripture has told us about whatever we're preaching on. So we'll go through that. A couple of books that I want to recommend, I'm going to recommend a few books um, here today. The, if you have never read uh, Fee and Stewart's How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, I'm just going to assume everybody has read that book. So if you haven't read that book, please don't disgrace yourself. Don't, don't announce that in the chat room. Just secretly kind of off to the side, write that down. It's a must read for anybody who is a serious uh, student of the scriptures, anybody who wants to preach the word. That is kind of like the ABCs of understanding the inductive process. If you want to go beyond that, I want to recommend Osborne's Hermeneutical Spiral. It's a very, very lengthy book. You can skip all of the chapters that have to do with Greek and, uh, uh, Greek and Hebrew and just focus on the principles of the hermeneutical process. For the sake of the timing of our call, we're not going to be able to look at that module on hermeneutics. And so I want to give you two books. They are Being Stewart's How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Don't tell us if you haven't read it and then Osborne's Hermeneutical Spiral. Uh, those books will actually walk you through not only the inductive process, but the hermeneutical process, which typically involves many, many layers uh, of engagement. The other book in this category I want to recommend is by Eugene Peterson. It's called Eat This Book. It's a phenomenal book that um, actually helps us to devotionally engage in scriptures as we're, as we're doing our inductive process. And so that's Peterson's uh, Eat This Book. And so I want to recommend that to you. Okay, having said that, let's just jump back into the presentation. And hopefully uh, we can all see this. If not, I can move the, the image around and maybe make it a little bit smaller so that our heads aren't in the way. There are different ways to configure your, the way in which you're seeing people as well. Above the uh, windows there, if you're new to uh, Zoom, you can tile it. You can show small icons or you can actually hide the thumbnail of uh, the other people who are in the video. So if you're having a problem actually seeing the presentation, uh, again, I'm gonna send the link to this file. You can download it, you can use it however you'd like, but then if you wanna actually view it during our call, uh, you'll need to actually either hide or minimize the other uh, people's heads, okay? All right. And I'm not able to see the chat box. I've actually minimized the, um, the icons for you all, and so if you're trying to communicate with me, it would be better if it's urgent, just unmute and interrupt me. So if there's something that we're missing right now before we get into the content, any questions or quick comments before we do that? Okay, looks like we're all ready to go. So kind of this is the presentation that you'll see. Um, and what we're gonna focus on is really kind of the layered uh, development of a message. So a message in my mind is almost like, if you remember your old biology books from like eighth grade, and you'd get to the center of the anatomy of the human body. And you typically have cellophane pages of the human body kind of layered on top of one another. And you look at the circulatory system and the muscular system and the skeletal system and the skin system. And if you remember that, that's the kind of mental approach that we're going to take to developing a message. And in order to understand that, I'm gonna say a couple of things in terms of what our goal is, because the goal is incredibly important. It's not just the method, it's the goal. I believe that um, millennials and really even beyond millennials, I think anybody who has kind of become native to postmodern um, consumption of media or learning methods, I think most people today by and large learn through a process that I refer to as epic. And epic refers to experiential process, iconic and communal. So we'll go ahead and take a look at each of those. Uh, so epic communication, uh, audiences need more than truth. Now, for those who are, of us who love the scriptures and believe that the scriptures are self-sufficient, that might sound like uh, I just blasphemed. But the reality mm -hmm. is that it is insufficient just to give your hearers 
propositional truths about the scriptures, propositional truths about God or about Jesus or about salvation, they actually need more than that. They need to understand how the truth invades their lives, can make a difference in their lives, in their world. They never need less than the truth, but they always need more than the truth. Audiences need more than relevance as well. And I think that's where we see the other side of this abuse, that we have sermons and churches and kind of methods of preaching that are so focused on the inductive, the hermeneutical process, that what you feel like you're getting oftentimes in sermons is kind of like um, the download dump from the speaker. Like every single Greek construction of the word, they're verse by verse preachers oftentimes, and they want to give you all of the stuff that they were so impressed by in their studies. But in reality, that's not going to really make any impact on the audience. On the other end of the spectrum, we have, uh, and I think this is probably the more popular uh, error, is that we have preaching that is nothing more than talks. And so if you're a person on the call here today who is accustomed to giving what I'm going to call talks, that are kind of topical, kind of pulling from scripture, borrowing from here and there. Let me ask you to make a pledge never to do this again. Even if you're asked to give a talk, if you're asked to give a thematic talk, and I'm asked very frequently, can you come and you talk about, I just got an invitation to speak at a, um, um, an adoption agency benefit. Uh, they're opening up a second, uh, second home, and I'm going to be the keynote speaker, and they want, to get, want me to give you a, a talk. Oh, I'm going to say yes, but in secret, what I'm going to go off and do is the same 32-hour process. I'm going to develop this message. I'm going to exposit the scriptures. Now, they might not know that they're getting expositional preaching, but at the end of the day, I believe there's only one power that can actually transform people's lives, and that's the Word of God. And so talks that are merely themes uh, or story-based talks or thematic-based talks that are devoid of scripture, in my mind, are powerless. And so we have to make a commitment to preach the word of God. Audiences need more than relevance. The gospel is both true and relevant, and to give our audiences an either or option is not good communication. These things come together in uh, epic communication. So a couple of things here, you go back here. Uh, people's true needs are often unperceived. There's another kind of method in preaching, it's kind of needs-based method uh, where we understand the needs of our audience, and we tailor make a talk to fit their needs. And that might sound good, but there's a, there's a subtle lie there that if we actually just meet people's needs, their lives can be different. In my opinion, the more you meet people's needs devoid of leading them to repentance and faith in Christ, the more needs reproduce, right? So if you actually meet a person's needs without satisfying their eternal needs, they just, they just make new, new needs. They just reproduce new needs. So people's true needs are oftentimes unperceived. True needs-based preaching assumes that people's greatest needs are ultimately eschatological, that they're tied to um, apocalyptic realities, eschatological realities, ways in which we've been designed, in, created in God's image, and destined for a world to come. So I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations of this. People's perceived needs are often symptoms of their true needs. Good preaching is not felt-based preaching, but seeks to awaken a person's true needs to those needs, right? So as a communicator, what I'm trying to do is help my audience understand that they might think this is their need, but ultimately what they've been designed for, ultimately what they are after is something, something much more profound, something much more comprehensive. So expositing the Bible into culture allows us to bring the power of God to bear on the hearts and minds of our audience in a way that, uh, that allows them to learn to trust us, right? And so we'll talk about the transaction that happens between communicators and the audience in just a few minutes, but I'm going to give you kind of a, an illustration here. So the goal of epic communication is to lead the listener into a greater awareness of their unperceived and their deeper needs. Right? So as I'm writing my message, uh, there might be 15 things that I know my audience cares about. Say they might be relationships, or they might be finances, or they might be the approval of parents, um, or a number of different things. Right? Those are their base perceived needs, and they all point to something much deeper. So by way of illustration, so a person might think in their heart of hearts, you know what? I really need more money. And if you ask them why and why and why, like what's behind the why, typically you'll get to an answer like, 
I, I wish I had more control in my life. And so people are typically wanting more control. Maybe they want to move out of their parents' home. Maybe they want to, um, you know, have greater mobility. They want to be able to travel. But really, those needs uh, point to a deeper need, and that is, I need God's leadership in my life. Because ultimately, if they had everything that they wanted, if they had the control that they wanted in their lives, um, they still wouldn't ultimately be happy. They would just reproduce some other affiliated need. Let me give you another illustration of that in just a minute or actually right now. So um, most of the preaching that I do for the last 15 years has been justice-based preaching, focusing on human trafficking, particularly the prepubescent um, uh, pay for rape industry of children, uh, uh, we call human trafficking. And so I'm dealing with people who are typically very concerned, uh, angered oftentimes about injustices, and we're seeing that now in other categories. Did somebody have a quick question? Okay. We're seeing this in other categories for sure. I think the racial tension in the United States hasn't been this high since really the 1960s. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of um, issues uh, that are masking the, the underlying issues. So when we talk about, say, um, police brutality, uh, when we talk about um, political rallies that don't have boundaries or borders to keep people safe or allow people to exercise free speech, the anger and the energy that people feel around that leads them to conclusions like, I long for a world made right. So if I could just have my political candidate, or if I could just have a diversified police force, or if I could just, and you fill in the blank for this intermediary fix, people would think that the world would be, would be made right. But as communicators, our job is maybe we can affirm their anger around injustices and affirm the value that we long for a world made right, but our ultimate goal is to get them to this final conclusion, I need to follow God toward his dream, his dream uh, for the kingdom or for shalom, right? And so how do we actually do that? Well, what I'm proposing is that we do that through a layered approach to engaging the scriptures. So the goal is to effectively lead adult learners in, transform in a transformational engagement with God. So I'm assuming that your audience is primarily adults. As university employees, we consider uh, college students to be adults, right? And so the goal is to lead them to a transformational engagement with God through the scriptures. So effective preaching is expository. The only power available to us is that uh, to trans uh, that is able to transform our audiences is the word of God delivered through the power of the Holy Spirit. And effective preaching is also relevant. So we can't just preach the word of God uh, in a vacuum. It exists in a context, and that context includes Black Lives Matter um, uh, events on the diag. It includes um, protesters around uh, political candidates. It includes um, inequities around um, uh, access to education. There are all of these ways in which the gospel and the word of God actually exist in a context. And as communicators, it's always our goal to actually bring those two worlds together for a transformational learning experience with our hearers. So expository communication that fails to connect with the heart and mind of our audience is more than failure. I believe it's damning because what it actually does is, is it anesthetizes them to hear it because they would begin to equate the ineffective mode of transmission with the ineffectiveness of the message being transmitted. And that not only happens in the, in the preaching acts that we, that we are engaged in, it happens on a systemic level, right? Uh, I think the large, the, largely the silence of evangelicals in the 60s around civil rights gave many Americans a reason to uh, turn a deaf ear to anything that would be Christian in terms of a solution. And what's interesting, there's a, a recent study that just came out, by, I think by one of our colleagues actually, that shows that our evangelical engagement with social issues like human trafficking, like extreme poverty, like racism, is actually legitimizing the gospel and the presence of the Christian church as a social action vehicle in the United States today. So how do we actually do that, capitalize that while protecting the word of God, the integrity of the word of God? There are three major focuses or foci of our layered development. They are God's word, they are adult learning, and they are transformation. So that's really kind of the main thing that I've all, that I've tried to communicate in this kind of preamble. So now we're gonna get into the actual uh, content. So those are the goals. 
So what is a layered message? And again, I want to draw us back to that, that um, metaphor of that eighth grade biology book where there was the circulatory system, the skeletal system, the muscular system, the skin system. There are all of these systems that comprise a human being. So let's actually look at those, right? So layered communication, I don't want you to get the idea that it's some kind of complex, mysterious, extremely difficult um, thing to accomplish, right? Our audience is oftentimes unaware. We do this well, they're entirely unaware. In fact, one of the things that upsets me most, uh, I'll put 32 hours into this message and some 18, 19 year old punk will come up to me and say, hey, Mr. Moore, you gave a great speech. Well, thanks. I just spent 32 hours giving this guy a great speech, right? Our goal isn't to give a great speech, but oftentimes at the end of the day, what people perceive is that we've given a, a brilliant message. Our delivery was on point. Uh, we connected well. We used great metaphor. Experiential learning was there. Uh, and they're unaware of all of these other layers that we've invested in ourselves. Layered communication is communication that brings a multidimensional facet of one single idea to bear in a way that is simultaneously way truth in life. Way because it persuades and prescribes a corrective course of action. Truth because it leaves no cause for intellectual disdain. And life because it offers the power for group and individual transformation. Let me say something really quickly about the truth level. Um, as we've moved from modernity into post-modernity, uh, audiences are not primarily concerned with propositional truth claims. And I know for some people that's a, that's a very, very difficult thing to, to get our heads around. I was converted as, a, as an atheist. I consider myself a recovering atheist. I was an honor student in the philosophy department at the University of Michigan. I love intelligentsia. I love propositional truths. I love Venn diagrams. I love logic, symbolic, Aristotelian, existential logic. I, I am a native modern. And uh, as our, our world transitioned into post-modernity, it also transitioned away from its primary concern being propositional truth claims. And so um, particularly when we engage in like apologetics or like topic-based issues that are more intellectually driven, we need to understand that our goal, particularly for millennials and postmoderns, isn't to persuade them of truth claims, but at the same time, I think we do ourselves a disfavor when we don't pay attention to the importance of truth claims. So in this statement, what I'm actually saying is that my goal is to not create problems where there aren't already problems. I don't want to leave people space for um, uh, intellectual ambiguity, intellectual uh, a feeling like I've been intellectually dishonest or manipulative, or perhaps I've... Um, ignored something that is core to what I'm communicating on because I didn't address it from uh, some kind of logical perspective. But my goal isn't to prove truth claims. It just isn't where our audiences uh, are really by and large anymore. And so uh, we can debate and dialogue about that, but we're going to go ahead and move on for the sake of time. So what are the five layers that I'm going to talk about? And I'll illustrate this again uh, in one of my more recent um, messages at the end of the presentation component. There's the hermeneutical and expositional level. This is the bone structure of the message. It conveys the power of God within the message, allowing the other layers to function, to hit the audience. And so expositing the scriptures, if that is like the one thing you hear me say today, it's the most important thing, that your power in communication is in this layer. It's expositing the word of God. Um, and again, the, the books that I've already recommended, Fee and Stewart's hermeneutical, uh, how to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, and Osborne's Hermeneutical Spiral will help you with that. We are really skilled in InterVarsity with that observation, interpretation, application. And so that really is the foundation of, the, uh, of this layer. And then there is the practical and illustrative layer. This layer represents the muscular layer in that it allows the Word of God to take flight in parts, of, uh, particularly in ways in the life of our hearers. It cannot assume that our audience just gets it. We have to give specific, relevant ways in which they are to employ and work out the Word of God. So the second, uh, rather, the, another additional resource I want to recommend to you is uh, this book by John uh, Bisagno. It's B-I-S-A-G-N-O, John Bisagno. And it's called Principled Preaching. And there's a, basically an idea in this book 
And he basically, the whole book revolves around him illustrating how this idea works. Now, I use this principle in every single message that I write. And basically, the formula that he states is that we state the principle, we explain the principle, we apply the principle, and we illustrate the principle. So if my message has one part, like the nine-minute cue message that I just gave, I'm going to do those four things. I'm going to state the principle, explain the principle, apply the principle, illustrate the principle. Now, I never say that, right? I don't get up and say, I am now stating my principle, and now let me explain what I just stated, right? I'm never saying that, right? It's a little bit more sophisticated than that. But in your writing, following this principle, this one principle will help you uh, develop a layered message that is very appealing, very um, intuitive, and connects practically with your audience. So I really, really want to recommend this book. It's called Principle Preaching by Bizagno, B-I-S-A-G-N-O. Okay, cultural historical, <clears throat> like the circulatory system, good communication contends for the faith and speaks to issues facing the church theologically, morally, and practically at the time the message is given. This is different from the expositional level layer, rather, because this layer has to do with how your message directly impacts the culture of the audience today. So that's a little typo there. Ignore that last uh, evangelistic layer. So what we're talking about here is that when you get up to speak, if you're not actually engaging the culture of your moment, maybe it's, um, maybe it's a shooting on your campus. Um, maybe a pastor has been dismissed in the community, a high-level, high-profile pastor, because of a moral failure. Uh, maybe there's some kind of other thing going on in your specific context. You shouldn't turn your message into a topical message about what's going on around you. But if your message actually doesn't speak to the realities that are going on around you, it really is, um, it's, it's, it's background noise for most of our hearers. Most of our hearers are living on Snapchat, they're living in Twitter, they're living on Instagram, um, they're consuming story through media, they're in their tribes or their communities, and your message is just one small piece of noise that typically people are trying to filter and process. But if a message can actually through the word of God, help people make sense of all of this scattered information and give them a way in which to apply it to their lives, it can be transformational. Again, that's the goal. The evangelistic layer, which is its own module, I said there are three other kind of core modules to the training that I do, and this is one of the other three. So there's like a basically another three-hour module that we could do at another point in time. But this is like the lungs that take in nourishing oxygen, distribute life to the entire body. The gospel ought always to be presented with clarity, with a call to repentance. At the end, we're going to actually talk about what it actually looks like to give a call to faith. Um, but this layer breathes life into those hearers who are dead in sin, but also hope to, uh, hope to those who languish as, as Christians. The gospel is the aim of every single evangelistic message. So it has to be a rare message. I, I, the message that we'll look at today is not an evangelistic message. Um, I was speaking to a room full of about 1,400 pastors from around the country, and so that would be an obvious illustration of where I'm pretty sure a call to faith hopefully wouldn't be what would be needed at the end of that message. But nine times out of ten, I'm giving a call to faith. Um, you know, and so that, that really is, to me as an evangelist, that's the most important part of, the, of this layer. And then there's the presentation layer. Now, this is where I think a lot of people have their anxiety and their concern is how they're going to present. So before I read this paragraph, let me just tell you um, a little, little story. When I first started as a campus worker with InterVarsity, in, I volunteered in 1993. I came on staff full-time in 1995. Most of my volunteering was as a speaker. So I came into InterVarsity as a communicator. And when I started doing chapter planting at Wayne State in downtown Detroit, I built the chapter primarily through my preaching gift. And so I preached every week or most weeks, gave calls to faith. Uh, and that's how the chapter grew was through my preaching gift. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. It's just how I chose to, to do ministry. And in the early years of preaching, I was obsessed with this one layer, obsessed with what was I going to wear? Uh, was my hair on fleek or on point? Um, how are people going to perceive me? Was it going to end well? Was it going to remember my script or my lines? You know, I was obsessed with this layer. And over the years, I've I've 
I've come to realize that while although this is important because it is the layer that people see, and so I need to take care of it, just like that skin layer, that outer visible skin layer of the body, it is not the most important layer. The most important layer is actually what happens between you and God in private. You, we, we can't give something to someone that we haven't already received. And so in our secret place, when we're pouring over the scriptures, that's why in my inverted pyramid, 18 hours of those 32 hours really is in that secret place of prayer and scriptural analysis. And I have found that if I do, um, if I do due diligence there and I invest my time and my energy in private with God, the presentation level is always on another level. There's an anointing, there's an unction, there's a sense of presence and power when I'm preaching, when I've spent time in prayer and in scripture, right? You can spend all that same 32 hours polishing a good talk. You could have the ideal TED talk with 6 million views online, and it could have absolutely no power whatsoever. So it is important, but it is not the most important. And I think as we begin to trust the power of the Word of God, we can actually begin to let go of a lot of the anxieties that rest and rely on us, whether or not people are going to like us at the end of our message, or whether or not we remembered our lines, or whether or not we wore the right outfit, or we offended somebody, right? Uh, Those are all somewhat important, but really nothing's more important than our time alone with God. So this skin is our outer or visible layer. It has to do with how we speak, what we speak, what's spoken, without, with and without words. This includes what we wear, to where we stand, to what visual and experiential tools we'll employ, repetition, choice of words, communal and spiritual learning acts. It's everything that the person sees and experiences in your communication transaction. And it is incredibly, incredibly important. When I think of athletes, um, I think of, you know, the vast amount of time, and I'm not an athlete. I, I, I do work out regularly. I hate every minute of it. I do the very bare minimum that enables me to wear cute clothes. So that's my objective is to wear great clothes. Um, and so I'm not an athlete, so I don't pretend to be an athlete, but I know lots of athletes. And athletes, the vast majority of what they do is unseen. And then we see 90 seconds or three minutes or 30 minutes or if you're an NBA all-star, you see a longer period of expression, but it's what they do off court that we know enables them to do what they do on court. And so I think speaking begets speaking. So if you want to get excellent at speaking, you speak more. You can take seminars. I've never really taken any kind of formal training for, for speaking. Um, I took a little seminar, retreat kind of seminar one, one, uh, one weekend way back about 20 years ago. But the number one way in which we actually become excellent communicators is through communicating. The more you speak, the more excellent you'll become at speaking. And so where to stand, what to do with your hands, uh, what kind of expressions, learning experiences, I'll I'll talk a little bit more in depth in a couple of minutes. All of these things are actually a matter of experience. And you can learn the principles, you can learn the methods, but there's nothing that's going to replace uh, that from experience. And so we need to get out there and and communicate. For some people who don't have lots and lots of opportunities, um, particularly for women, I think it's um, after now doing years and years of of training and speaking, development, evangelistic development for our female staff, um, it can be very, very hard to get speaking opportunities. Uh, And I'll just say this, we need to be shameless. If God's given you an unction, if God's given you a desire, if he's given you a passion for speaking, just invite yourself. I'd say the first 10 years of my speaking career, all I did was invite myself to other people's stuff. Are you having a conference? Who is your speaker? Oh, you don't have one? Guess what? You should have me as your speaker. I did that for 10 years, right? And so I I think for many of us who don't um, have a platform or who don't, have books or those kinds of things, or maybe there are other things culturally going on. Uh, Maybe it's our context. Maybe we're an ethnic minority in a dominant culture context, or maybe we're female in the church, which is notorious for obstacles in terms of getting uh, in the pulpit or getting speaking opportunities. Press those doors, ask for favors, work your networks, because speaking begets speaking, and speaking makes excellent speaking, okay? So I know that that really kind of is not enough to go on, but that's um, typically we would spend a lot more time on this in uh, the speaker's cohort, which is where a lot of this content was developed for. So if I'm just wetting your appetite and making you more frustrated, uh, please forgive me. But for the sake of time, let's move on. So the end product of a layered message 
is a seamless integration of spiritual power derived from the Word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit, nuanced contextualization of spiritual truths for the audience in their context, all threaded together with prophetic and applicable wisdom with the aim of leading adult hearers into a transformational encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. That in one sentence is what I've just talked about up until this point in the call. And so um, I'm gonna talk for about 10 more minutes, 15 at the most, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the call actually talking about some of these principles. So we're gonna move a little bit quicker now through some of these other uh, sections. So, uh, in fact, I didn't intend to do this. Well, in the um, <clears throat> I, epic, experiential process, iconic and communal, I want to give you another resource. This is a book by Mark Miller. It's called Experiential Storytelling. This book um, is the number one. I can't even think of another book even like it. There's no other book like this in the universe that I've, been a, I've been a, uh, become aware of. This book will help you design a, an experience around your message that brings the environment, it brings people's experiences, it brings community all together, particularly if you're planning a, planning a conference or like a message series. This book is an invaluable tool. It's Mark Miller's Experiential Storytelling. I just want to, want to highlight a couple of the things in this section uh, before we move on. So experiential communication moves beyond uh, a monologue. Uh, where one speaker is audibly communicating to an audience. Modern audiences have come to expect uh, interaction. So I encourage people to use Instagram and Twitter while I'm, while I'm preaching. I'll actually put the hashtags in my Prezi or in my PowerPoint. If the church or the conference is using ProPresenter, I'll go back to PowerPoint. So I'll also have the audience interact experientially. I've use all kinds of things. If you've seen uh, my messages at Urbana 06 and 09, you, I, I came up with the glow stick idea, but I've used fire and sand and water and freestanding doors and all kinds of crazy things to actually um, help people enter into the text experientially. Experientially, experiential, experiential learning needs to be relevant to the text. So when I look at a passage of scripture, I'm actually looking for those key concepts, those phrases, or the antithesis of those key concepts. That's another trick I'll talk a little bit about later. To create a metaphor and then tie that metaphor to some kind of experiential learning in the message. Okay, so let me come back to that at the end and give you a practical illustration. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump through that. So that's experiential process, the sermon event ought better to be thought of as delivering a smorgasbord or painting of a mosaic rather than a flow chart. So I think one of the worst, and we've all been, we've all sat under the tyranny of a very knowledgeable but poor communicator, right? Where they have A equals B equals C, and don't you want to buy B, right? And so there's the flow chart process, right? When I write a message, what I'm trying to do is actually paint a picture with words. And I've been doing that really for about 15 out of the 20 years I've been speaking. And for the first time ever at a conference at, for InterVarsity down in Florida, uh, just this past, I think it was October, a student came up to me and he said, you know, while you were speaking, man, it was kind of like, kind of like you were painting a picture in my brain with your words. I was like, finally, somebody gets it. You know, I didn't know if the guy was high or, or what, but, uh, I was really super excited because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I was raised by two artists. My parents were sculptors and painters. And so I grew up in an art gallery. And um, much to their uh, shame and disappointment, I have no artistic abilities when it comes to like sculpting and painting. My abilities are, are revolve around word gifts. And so how I express myself as an artist is by using my word gifts to paint a picture in people's minds so that they can connect with the word of God. Okay. So ask yourself these assessment questions to build process into your message. What are the natural breaks and flow of a program? So your message almost always exists in a church service or in a conference setting or a large group setting on a Thursday night at InterVarsity. What are the other elements that are going on and how can you actually use those elements to preach your message so that your, your message isn't, just the, isn't the only thing that's communicating the passage? the songs, the testimonies, the videos, uh, the room itself, 
there are lots of ways in which we can build process into the learning experience. How does one element lead into the next? What's the best way to transition your message into your message, out of your message? So I'm obsessed. When I come and speak, I want to know what's happening right before I get up and what's happening right after I get up or uh, get down, right? So if there's a song, well, what song? Who's singing the song? Is it um, a female vocalist or is it, uh, you know, what, I want to know exactly what's happening right before. If there's a video, I'm going to look at that video. I'm going to obsess about that video. If it doesn't fit well with my text and I need to adapt, then I'm going to adapt. If it doesn't feel, fit well with my message and they need to adapt, I'm going to ask the venue to actually um, either not show that video or show it in a different place. But I'm thinking about how my message fits into the larger experience for the hearer. All right, how are we doing on time? It's okay. <clears throat> All right, so an iconic communication. So again, we're doing epic, experiential process, and now we're to iconic. Iconic communication, while it may be visual at times, has more to do with connecting the grand meta-narrative contours of life with our audience and inviting them, into, in, 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 inviting them to see themselves in the story. So the um, Price of Life campaign that I've been doing for the last 15 years, um, we've done hundreds of events uh, all across the country focusing on anti-trafficking. And one of the bigger campaigns that we did was in New York City, uh, where we did about 100 events over the course of 10 days on 17 campuses. And I was going to um, speak at one of the main events at the end of the week at uh, the city center, which is in, uh, just off of, um, it's, it's, it's in, my, in Manhattan. And um, as I'm writing this message, I'm listening to the Word of God, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit direct me to the passage, and the Spirit of God directs me to the passage uh, where it says, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but it's what comes out, licentiousness, these kinds of things. And I thought, well, that's a very odd passage. I can't preach that in New York City of all places, the most secularized, biblically illiterate place in the United States. No one's going to understand, no one's going to listen to that. So I tried to change the Holy Spirit's mind. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I'm in the business of trying to change the Holy Spirit's mind. And so I, after begging and pleading for several weeks, really, um, the Spirit kept bringing me back to this passage. And I thought, well, how can I actually paint a picture that's iconic? So we're not talking about the visuals that are going to be on the screen. We're talking about iconic communication is that kind of metaphor-based, metaphor-rich element of your message that's connecting viscerally to your audience. And so I thought of all of these ways in which a person is defiled by revealing what's in their heart, greed and lust and licentiousness and avarice and these kinds of things. And I thought, you know what, this is really a picture of a person who's already living in death. And what's the antithesis of that? Well, it's life. But where do we actually see life in its fullest expression? In the birth of a child? Um, in the proposal, uh, 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 a guy's going to ask a girl to marry him. We see that's a very vibrant Facebook moment, you know, uh, wedding day. And so I thought, I'm going to use the wedding day itself as a kind of the antithesis, and I'm going to use that metaphor as what it actually looks like to live into the life of Jesus Christ and invite people into what I ended up calling the Isle of Destiny. And you can see this message on my YouTube channel and see how I handle that metaphor. And so iconic communication, it, it, it takes the felt needs and the cultural context and the word of God, and it chooses a metaphor that is pregnant enough to draw your audience into the story so that they can see themselves in that story, All right? So hopefully that makes sense. If you're, if you're taking notes and you have questions at the end, we're almost to the, the time for questions and answers. I'm going to just jump down here to this bottom one. Iconic communication takes the particular image being used, whether it's verbal or visual, and expresses that greater transcendent, uh, what I call an existential referent. And so I will typically take my metaphor and then choose something that's tangible to represent that metaphor. So at the end of that message in the Isle of Destiny, I had... Um, I don't want to call them flower girls because they were women, but bridesmaids and flower girls actually walk into the auditorium uh, in what you would typically see somebody very, very ornate dress at a wedding, and they were dropping rose petals onto the floor. 
And my invitation was to embrace the Isle of Destiny, to come to the one that you were made for by getting up out of your seats, going to the aisles, and retrieving one of these rose petals. We had two different color rose petals. One was red, which represented a, a first-time commitment to Jesus. The other one was white, coming into the story of God by entering into the kingdom work of fighting for justice and caring for the downtrodden and the oppressed. But the metaphor actually came from the passage. Everything goes back to the passage, but it connects viscerally with our hearers. That's, what, that's an illustration of iconic communication. All right, <clears throat> one more, and that's communal. And then we have a couple of uh, things to take care of before we open it up for questions and answers. So the preaching event is a transaction that happens between you as the communicator, his or her programming colleagues, and the audience as a whole. People perceive themselves as a part of a community and experiencing the preaching event together kind of puts them in this frame of mind that they're in something together, right? They're experiencing this together. And there's a transaction that's going there. It's a back and forth. You're building trust. They're learning to trust you. You're taking risks. They're accepting those risks. You're moving forward. There's a transaction that's going on as we, as we preach. It's imperative to create and sustain a sense of healthy community and to invite that community to participate, not merely receive the program or preaching event. I think humor is a big part of that. So I, this is a, one that I have to work out a little bit more, um, uh, more strongly at because I'm more of a cerebral kind of person. I typically have to think about how am I going to invite my audience into laughter and to joy. Um, joy can, can do that. Your experiential learning uh, elements can do that. Again, I want to re reiterate that Mark Miller book, Experiential uh, Storytelling. But the preaching event itself is a part of a communal experience. And thinking through that communal experience as a communicator and how that community is connecting as a community, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people are making today in preaching is that they're, they, when they think of audience, they're thinking of individuals in the audience. And that represents our kind of Western dichotomous way of thinking, radical individualism, radical um, you know, individual kind of self-centered messaging. Our audiences are more and more thinking through the message as it applies to their tribe, right? So they might not be identifying with everybody in the room, but they're thinking, well, how does this, act, how does this message intersect me in my community? Right, whether that's be a, an ethnic community or an affiliated, uh, you know, uh, community in terms of interests and ideas, or perhaps a professional development uh, community. So, in the Q event that I recently spoke at, I would say the majority of the people in the room were people who are highly, highly involved in southeastern Michigan. We have about five million people uh, who live in the southeastern Michigan corridor. We had judges and lawyers and doctors and law enforcement in the room, and so. They're thinking about my message, sure, how does it apply to my marriage, or how does it apply to, you know, how I'm thinking about pornography, or as an individual. So we're not saying that that's not true, but what they're also thinking through is how does this impact me as a member of this larger community, right? And so thinking through that as a, as a communicator is incredibly important. So let's end the lecture part by talking about the actual call to faith, and then we'll spend the rest of our time actually interacting as a community. So thanks for putting up with uh, a bunch of lecture. I know that uh, it's always hard to just jump right in without uh, much interaction in the beginning, but let's talk about the call to faith. Not all calls to Christ are answered positively. So just tell yourself, when you give a call to faith, you know that there are people in the audience who are not going to respond, or maybe they're going to respond negatively. I'm going to come back to a couple of stories about that. Nearly every call to follow Christ is accompanied with some kind of tangible statement of appropriation. I try to create that um, illustration or that appropriation event. So um, if it's, um, you know, many of us were just at David Platt's um, message at Urbana where he cracked the glow sticks. So in 1996, or, 19, or 2006 rather, when I was working with the Urbana team creating some kind of experiential way in which the audience was going to appropriate that event, I came up with this idea of the glow stick based on the passage. I was, pe I was preaching uh, John chapter three, the light has come, right? And I wanted to actually illustrate how the light comes into darkness. And so I asked the event organizers at Urbana, make sure the lights are down, we're gonna distribute these glow sticks. And that was a symbolic way uh, for women and men to appropriate what they had heard, right? And so that's an illustration. There's a, um, an article on my website, which is tellthestory.net, 
called, um, I think it's just called uh, Calls to Faith. And you can find that in the media tab on my website. There's a whole article that I've written on this particular aspect. So signs of appropriation, when somebody who has actually taken Christ into their lives, they include things like baptism, and oftentimes people will get rid of things, they'll sell things, uh, utterance of certain creeds, laying on hands, uh, certain manifestations of the Holy Spirit, um, ways in which people's change, their lives change. Most of those things happen over the course of a period of time. So as a communicator, you need to be asking yourself, what's the one thing that I want my audience to do right now in the three minutes that I'm calling them to respond to faith? Right? That's what you should ask yourself every single time you're done with your message. To say, what, do I, what am I asking my audience to respond to? And I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them three minutes. Now, I'm going to come back to why I keep on saying three minutes in just a second. But a call is always both to receive forgiveness as well as to surrender to Christ's lordship. The call oftentimes comes with an explanation that to follow Christ is to become a witness for Christ. And so I don't divorce personal repentance from actually entering into the kingdom work of evangelism or, or witness. I invite people to become connected to Christ and to make him known in the world. Very frequently I'll do that at the end of my message. Um, let's just jump to this last point. The call... Uh, is also an entry point for the community of faith, not a call for the individual deta uh, to an individual detached faith. So when I call people, I'm actually calling them to Jesus as an individual, but I'm also calling them into a communal experience. I'm calling them to be a part of the Christian community, right? And there are lots of ways in which we can do that with our words. But let me just go to one last slide here um, on calls of faith. Here, here we go. And that's the contours of the call. I think if I do this, this would be better. Here we go. So your call to faith needs to be creative. Spend some time developing one central image for your message and bring in a couple of tangible points of contact. So I'm going to give you another illustration. There's a message that I, I preach. Uh, I think it's, in, um, it's, it's at the festival uh, where Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let them come to me, and from within will spring rivers of living water. And so I can't, I can't figure out how to make water come out of rocks, so I thought I'll make rocks come out of water. So in this particular call to faith, I have two large hurricane uh, flasks filled with water about three-quarters up at the front of the auditorium or the stage or the platform or where uh, I've done this at an outdoor um, festival as well. And... Uh, at the bottom of each of these hurricane flasks are black stones and white stones. And the symbology comes from the passage because at the end of this festival, the community leaders would pour out libation offerings in the form of water. So they would pour the water out onto stones to remind the Israelites that God at one point cared for them by causing water to come from stones, right? So here are the stones and the water in the front. As I'm calling people to receive the living water of Christ, I invite them to come forward and to take their arm and to reach all the way in and to grab a rock. Now, I intentionally put the rocks at the bottom of a, it's about a three and a half, four foot flask, so that they have to get their arm wet about up to their, their armpit in order to retrieve one of these, one of these rocks. The black stone represents uh, um, something that they're struggling with, a sin, a stronghold, perhaps it's pornography addiction, maybe it's cutting, uh, maybe it's some kind of in a form of racism. And that's their way of saying they want to be set free from the power of darkness. The white stone is actually a symbol of coming to faith in Christ. And it, it, there's a way in which I communicate that to the audience. And so as they're reaching in, they're appropriating the message in an experiential way. Their arm is wet. They have something to take uh, with them. It's relatively inexpensive. And most importantly, it's tied to the passage. Now, after doing this for a few times, I realize, particularly for people in wheelchairs and for people who are short, um, I'll never forget doing this at a church. There was a little old lady who started the, the call of the faith. She was the first one to come down, and she was looking at me, and she says, I'm not going to be able to reach the rock. I'm not going to be. And I kept on saying, you can reach it. You can reach it. She's in there dangling her little arm, and she couldn't even get to the bottom. So finally, I had to come and, and retrieve it. So now since then, what I actually do, I troubleshoot shoot that. And I have people who are stationed who are able to retrieve the, the stone or someone who is unable to do that. And so thinking through so, some of those things are important. So, All right. 
Uh, avoid, avoid imagery and interactive elements that need detailed explanation, as that will detract from the gospel itself. So the image needs to be vivid, needs to be tied to the passage, needs to be easy to understand. If you're taking time to explain what the symbol means, you're missing the point. It just needs to just flow. It needs to be natural. Uh, and so there are lots of ways in which, um, will I actually say that here? One of the ways in which I get these ideas, I, I walk through Ikea or I get on Amazon.com. Um, there's, there's one that I do with incense and bowls. I got that idea from Amazon. Uh, I'm just looking for very inexpensive, large scale, small pieces of that might be able to, I, I can tie to the passage. The call needs to be clear. The gospel content itself is the most important aspect of a call for decision. Create an expectation for that call for the decision early on in your message. So very frequently, we call this a set toward action. When I get up and speak, after about five to seven minutes of a message, I'll actually say something like, and tonight, you're going to have an opportunity to respond to Christ. Tonight, you're going to have an opportunity to make a decision. Tonight, you're going to have an opportunity to come into the community of faith. I'll say things like that throughout my message so that I'm preparing people to do business with God. Uh, so I'm creating that expectation. I'm stating my invitation, I'm restating it, I invite, I reinvite, I wait, I reinvite. So let me just say, say that, that's probably the, uh, I'm actually gonna come back to that at the bottom. So compelling, the gospel needs to be explicated in a consistent concept. The gospel needs to be demonstrated both globally and personally. The gospel needs to be communicated in such a way that it's the most important and the most impassioned part of your message. So if you're preaching at this level, and it's not the gospel, let me ask you to dial it down to this level and save that sense of passion and conviction for Jesus. There's really nothing in your message that should be more um, exuberant, more passionate than when you're talking about Jesus Christ. Comprehensive, it may make sure that your gospel explication and application are relevant for all types of hearers. So when I write a message, my target audience are what I call the non-churched and the anti-church. That's my primary target audience. Those are the people I love the most. I love to connect with them. But I also need to think about the, the church skeptic. I need to think about how females are hearing the message uh, versus men. I need to think about various ethnic groups. Are there artists in the room? And how are they hearing the message in a different way from engineers? Uh, are faculty in the room? And so how can I build in elements to my message that are going to connect well with faculty? Those are things that I'm taking into, con uh, into consideration. Uh, though one element of the gospel may, may take more of a central role, depending on the audience and the objectives, the entire gospel has to be preached every single time you preach. And this, again, this is part of the larger three-hour seminar on evangelistic preaching that we, we didn't get into. But there are, in my mind, there are 10 elements to effective gospel communication. There's another Prezi, if you follow this link, there'll be a whole ton, there'll be a ton of other Prezi's that you can take a look at, and there's one on... Um, evangelistic uh, preaching, and it'll go through all 10 minutes. And then finally, continuous. And this is where I kind of want to end, tarrying. So tarrying is an old concept, just like that word I used at the beginning of the call, that sacred desk idea. Tarrying is something that Spurgeon and Finney and Wesley and others would refer to as the time that happens in the message where you're calling, where you're inviting, re-inviting, begging, pleading. Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Right, and so we're we're calling on people to make the right decision. And it's always the right decision to follow Jesus. And so, in my mind, as I get up, I always envision myself as the last link in a long process for many people in that room. Right, I know that other people are still going to go on in process after I'm done. But for many, many people in that room, when I give the call, I think that I'm the last link in their story before they cross the line. When, when I preach the gospel, I just believe that there are going to be people in the room who are going to respond. I would probably say in the last 15 years, there have been three times out of the hundreds of messages that I've given where there hasn't been someone who has responded to the good news. And it's not because, you know, I'm some fantastic speaker or some great evangelist. It's just because I believe the gospel is power. And that when people hear the gospel, there are always going to be some who will reject. There are always going to be some who will accept. Right. And, and by and large, I think that 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 general rule has has been true. And so this idea of tearing then becomes very, very important, because what happens if you've, if you've seen this and perhaps you've done this when somebody is giving a powerful message, you know, it's moving toward that call to faith. Or maybe you yourself, you're moving toward that call of faith. Then all of a sudden they start to stumble. 
there's fear, there's apprehension, and they'll say something like, if God has touched your heart today, or if this message is making sense to you, or maybe you're sensing a desire to have a relationship with God today, why don't you call the church office? I mean, or, or, I mean, I've actually heard speakers say things like that. Or, I'll be down here in the front afterwards if you would like to talk, right? And to me, it's just kind of like you just threw water on a fire, right? And so the idea of tarrying is probably the most um, risky and vulnerable thing that you will do in evangelistic message. Because what you're actually doing is you're giving people three minutes to do business with God. And that's my principle, three minutes. So it doesn't sound like a lot of time, but I, I bet you if you stand on a platform for three minutes in interspersed between silence and calling, silence and calling, it's going to feel like an eternity. And so I usually prep the audience by saying, we're going to end our time here today by giving people an opportunity to think about what's just happened. I'm going to give people an opportunity to do business with God. And so for some people, maybe not you, but for some people here today, this is a holy moment. This is a sacred moment. And we want to respect that, right? We don't want to detract from what God might be doing in some people's hearts here today. We want to give them an opportunity to respond personally to God. And here's how we're going to do it. I have these flasks of water up here with these stones, or in a moment, my friends are going to come with these glow sticks, or in a moment, you're going to be able to get up out of your, receipt, your seats and retrieve one of these simple cones of incense that are going to represent you entering into the great storybook of God, right? There are lots of different ways that I'll say this. I'm prepping the audience. And then I'll say these words. And for those of you who have seen some of my messages, you'll actually remember this. I always say, and that time is now, right? Now, once I say that, that's when my three minutes starts. And that time is now. God is calling many of you to come forward. God is calling many of you to make the decision of a lifetime to come to Jesus Christ. And I'm entering into that tarrying. And I'm going to go back and forth between silence. Maybe I'm praying. Maybe I'm citing a passage of scripture. There's reflective music, perhaps, in the background. Um, there's commotion. There are people getting up, moving around. And almost always, when you start that three-minute interval, you're going to start it in a place of extreme vulnerability and awkwardness because it's just you. The first person hasn't raised their hand or come forward or cracked a glow stick, and it's just you. You just wait. You just wait and pray. You wait in faith. And believe that God is doing something. He's moving. Don't end it too quickly. I've seen many, many speakers. They say, well, it's just too awkward. And 50 seconds in, they're done, right? I want to challenge you. Maybe even you start your, 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 your clock. or Maybe you have something on the podium that can time yourself. You give it three minutes before you end that time. And very frequently, you'll go past the three minutes because many, many more people are, are responding. At that same conference in, in Florida, people were responding for a number of different ways. But I, I'd probably say about you know, 70, 80 people came forward for, for some reason or another during that call. That took more than three minutes. So three minutes to me is the minimum amount of time that I'm going to give an audience an opportunity to respond. Uh, so stating and restating your invitation to Christ and then waiting gives the Holy Spirit time to wrestle with that person who's considering Christ. And then waiting for decisions sets aside that, uh, rather waiting for decisions sets aside the moments before a response uh, is holy. Rightly done, it prevents manipulation, and uh, it prevents manipulation and promotes it. So I think what I'm trying to say here, besides the awkwardness of this sentence, is that when you actually tarry, when you give time and you call, you wait, you call, you wait, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? You're actually respecting people. You're not disrespecting them. You're giving them time to process with really the most important decision they'll ever make in their lives. And I can tell you from 25 years of speaking experience that the vast majority of people who are uncomfortable with this, the vast majority of criti criticism that you'll get as you tarry is from Christians who are themselves uncomfortable because they know Christ is on the line, that you've put the gospel and their faith to the test and you've made them uncomfortable. Now, they might not say those words. They'll say that you've manipulated or you're emotionally manipulated. I'll end with this last story, and then we'll open up um, for questions. I just uh, spoke at my alma mater, where I became a Christian, the University of Michigan, uh, Dearborn, um, just a few nights ago on Thursday. And I met Jennifer. And Jennifer, um, I had already heard the entire story from her staff worker, but I pretended not to know anything about it. I don't know if you've ever done that or not. But um, 
So Jennifer introduced herself to me. She's very timid, very introverted, and she was a little bit anxious. She kept dropping things, stumbling over her words. I said, just calm down, Jennifer. You know, I've seen you now three times this year. I've spoken at this chapter three times this year, and every time I've seen you in the audience. And, um, you know, what's going on with you? What's your story? And she, she started by saying, when you came to speak in, I think it was September, October, and you gave the call for people to become Christians, she says, I was angry, and I decided that I was never coming back again because it was manipulative. It was very, one of the very few times that I ever heard a non-Christian actually say those, those words. Uh, at the time, she was, pra- she was a practicing Wiccan, and the staff worker, um, Christy, who's a fa- fantastic uh, woman of God, doing a great work at uh, U of M Dearborn, got a hold of her, started studying with her, doing a gig. And uh, after a while, Jennifer admitted, she said, well, the real reason I was uncomfortable with York's message was because I felt that God was pulling me. And I, I didn't want to say yes to God. And so I was uncomfortable because I was convicted. So then I came back again, and I gave another message, and she felt, again, she felt deeply, deeply convicted. And at that time, she didn't give her life to Christ as well. It was a few weeks later when Christy was studying in in a gig with her um, that she had given her life to Christ. I said, so when did you actually cross the line, Jennifer? And she threw her purse down, she rummaged through it, and she pulled out this little Gideon Bible, and she opened the back of it, and she said, right here, November 30th, 2015 is when I gave my life to Christ. And now here you are preaching again. And she said these words to me. She, she said, I feel like your three messages have framed uh, my entire faith journey, right? From beginning to end, because now I'm, I'm, I'm an intern, I'm, I'm learning to be a leader and a contributor in the community. And that's what you were talking about here tonight. And she just feels like, I, I feel like you've been along for the whole journey. I didn't know any of that. All I knew is that I was, Tarrying, I was calling, I was giving people an opportunity to correct that. It offended her, but it also was the part of a journey for her. All right, so let's go ahead. I know uh, that's been a lot of content. So um, as you speak, unmute your mic so the rest of us can hear. And we're going to take about 20 minutes to do some Q&A. It can be about the content that I've, I've been talking about, or it can be something that I didn't touch upon that you were hoping that I, I did. Hey, York. Uh, this is Paul. Um, you uh, were giving the four points from the book Principle Preaching, and I only got three of them. And I just wondered if you could state, explain, apply, and what was the fourth one? And illustrate. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Other questions? I have a question. Hi, York. Hey. Uh, in, in terms of large group talks, A lot of our talks are 20 to 25 minutes, which can sometimes feel like a really short time. Um, I think our staff often prepare more, and then we're we're doing the editing process. Do you have any tips on how to get through a lot of this in that short amount of time? Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot lot harder. I'm getting a little feedback. Thanks for meeting me. It's a lot harder to, to write shorter messages than longer messages because you can throw lots and lots of things into a longer message. You can build rapport over a longer period of time. 20 to 25 minutes, however, is not a short amount of time. That is a long amount of time. It always surprises me when people invite me to speak and they say, here's 40, 45 minutes. That doesn't exist anywhere. At my church, our messages are 25 minutes. At large group meetings, it's 25 minutes. So. 25 minutes is the standard. And um, if you can't do everything that I've talked about in 25 minutes, you need to go back to the drawing board. So in a couple minutes, I'm going to go back to a OneNote um, file and show you kind of what this looks like behind the scenes. But you should be able in 25 minutes to do everything that I've said, right? And if you want some illustrations, again, my website, tellthestory.net, has lots of illustrations. But what I would say practically is you should if if you have some staff who are routinely going over like you give them 25 minutes and they get they're doing 35 minutes now the new format should be 15 minute large group talk talks so that way when they go 20 25 minutes over um you know you're still within range so at urbana like it's a, a long message at urbana would be like 18 minutes i think uh, i've spoken three times on the platform and I think the longest I ever got was 12, and I had to do three months of negotiation for an extra three minutes, right? It was like, 
if you, go, if you go back and you look at other Urbana speakers, right? So I'm just kind of using that as a kind of like a high threshold. Uh, just uh, the amount of stuff that you're able to get into a nine minute or a 13 minute message is incredible. You listen to some of these TED Talks, some of these Q Talks, they're some of the most earth shaking, groundbreaking messages I've ever heard, and they're all nine minutes. So there's no reason you shouldn't be able to write. I think it's a, oftentimes it's a lack of focus, a lack of clarity, maybe a lack of creativity, or maybe they get caught in the moment, or maybe they're anxious. I think anxiety and being caught in the moment, uh, when things go well for novice speakers, they tend to go long. Uh, and so those are, those are kind of things that over time you can give feedback to people and coach them. But if they're not following the rules, if they're not living within their time parameters, you, you need to give them less time next time. So my goal as a communicator, if you give me 24 minutes, I'm going to give you two minutes back in your program. And 90% of the time I finish two minutes under the allotted amount of time. And I'll time myself out over and over again until I get that under, under time. Thanks. Yeah. Just to clarify that 25 minutes also includes the, the invitation, the call, the three minutes response for you? No, not for me. Typically, no, not for me. Typically, it's, it's, it's on top of that. On top of that. So content for the message is 25 minutes. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? I have a question. Um, how often do you recommend sharing personal stories? Every time. Yeah, I think particularly for the milieu in which we're in, your personal story is incredibly valuable. It's a high value asset. I start almost all of my messages with something that's extremely personal, extremely vulnerable, so I can build rapport as fast as I can through, you know, through humility or through something that might be embarrassing. Think of David Platt's message uh, again at Urbana, which was absolutely masterful. I mean, that was just, that just took so much guts to read that and, and say what he said about himself. Just painful, you know? So I would recommend stories very, very often. But here's the problem with stories is that they can actually come to eclipse the exposition. And so, only tell stories that are actually going to eventually exposit the passage. They're going to add understanding to the passage that you're expositing. They, shouldn't, they should never be superfluous or just to build rapport. They should always connect to the passage. Great question. Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, York. Uh, a, a lot of... Uh, speaking that campus staff members do are uh, it's in the midst of a number of other things on their plate um, uh, you uh, right now are in a season of life where you get to think largely about speaking and communicating professionally whereas it's one piece of a larger ministry job description for a lot of CSMs so uh, any thoughts on that that 32 or 36 hours of prep that you would do that uh, probably seems uh, <laughs> difficult <laughs> yeah. uh, for the, the, the campus staff member, maybe even for many busy pastors. Oh yeah, especially for pastors who are speaking every week. Yeah. So I would consider myself like, if I could use a sports metaphor again in my great repertoire of sports knowledge, it, there's a difference between the NFL and the major leagues, right? So major league baseball, you're grinding those games out week in, week out, every day, sometimes multiple games a day. You know, NFL, you got like, what, 16 games, right? So as a, as a conference-oriented speaker, I'm more of like an NFL player. I, I can write one message and deliver it 16 times in different parts of the country. If you're a campus staff worker or your campus pastor, you, you've got one audience, and maybe you're speaking multiple times a month, you're grinding it out, that 32-hour period of time might seem a little bit unrealistic. So here's, here's a recommendation. You, you speak less frequently so that you can invest that amount of time, right? That doesn't work for pastors. So I think some of the best pastor communicators in the country are finding that amount of time. I can't think of excellent kind of what I would call tier one pastors like an Andy Stanley who aren't putting at least 22 hours a week into their messages, right? So that might be a little bit more realistic. Sometimes when I say 32 hours, 
I'm going to spread that over, over the course of three or four weeks. I'm not doing that. If I have one week, which is rare, if I have one week that's free in my calendar, which almost never happens, I'll try to do that, but it's, it's rare. So if you're a campus staff worker and you're struggling with that amount of time, I would say try to speak less frequently, or maybe, maybe what you do is you craft what I would call, um, you know, like one of your signature messages, a message that you can give over and over and over again. And you're putting that amount of time into that message. But then there are these kind of in-season messages that are, and there's another um, module that we teach in the speakers um, training cohort called uh, extemporaneous speaking. So there is a way that you can expose the scripture with, without putting almost any time at all into your process. You're asked to speak at the Rotary Club the night before or at some youth group three days before the event. There's a way in which you can do the principles that I've taught here with almost no preparation at all. That would take an entirely different call. That's a great, great question though. So, and there's no science to it. My 32 hour isn't like a, it's a guideline. It's not like religious law. So. Okay, a few more questions and we're gonna jump back into the, the OneNote just by way of illustration. Just a quick follow-up question to that question. Um, do you find that you spend less time preparing now since you're a seasoned speaker. Does that prep time go down for you? More, more. It's gone. It's gone. Okay. And I think it's I think it's really gone up because of um, because what's at stake. I think for some of the things that I speak at is is higher, and there's less forgiveness. Um, and so I know that if I bring my C game, and it's just just okay. It's not going to be good at all. I'm more likely to offend people. I'm more likely to, you know, contradict other speakers on the platform. Or there's a lot more forgiveness when you're living in community and you can actually re-explain what you said last week or continue what you said last week. I almost never get that opportunity because my speaking engagements are all in different locations. I do speak frequently at my church, and so that's different. And I've found a lot of freedom in that because. There, it's not do or die. I know that people are still going to love me. I'm still a part of the community, you know. Um, but I would say my, my speaking time has actually gone up. So I, I used to think 16, 17 hours was enough time to develop a message. I'm just getting started now in 16, 17 hours. So. Do you personally um, preach from a manuscript or an outline or just internalize the message? How do you do that? Yeah, so there are different ways to do that. I personally, um, I write a verbatim script. It's usually an eight to 12 page paper, single space, and I memorize the entire thing. So when I get on the platform, my notes are there, but I don't, I don't read them unless there are times that I actually want to read and it'll look a little strange. Like if it's a long quote, the message I just recently wrote has a very long quote from Maurice Loft Wolf. It would look strange for me to recite that from memory. So I'll pick the page up and I'll read it. But apart from that, I'm a script guy. There's nothing wrong with being an outline person. I think some of the best communicators I know, they think long and hard about what they're going to say in this section, but they never write it out. I think um, out of discipline though, if you're an outline person, I would challenge you, particularly the stories that you intend to share. And the more familiar the story, the more important this is. I want to challenge you to write out your stories verbatim. Because I think what you're going to realize is that you're missing parts that would be relevant. You're including parts that are not relevant. Um, you can take a story that you're very familiar with and you can polish it and it could be something that's just really extraordinary if you take the time to write it out and memorize that part. So I don't really have a fast and hard rule. But I, I, I think most people that I know are, are outline people. And they, they, don't, they don't take the time to write out an actual script. I just don't trust myself. So really for me, it's a matter of trusting myself. I know that if I get off and I haven't written out every single word, I'm going to say something so incredibly off. My wife on Facebook or Twitter, she's like my great like, critic. Like, she's like, oh, York, what, what were you thinking? How could you have done that? You've shamed the family. You know? <laughs> so it's like, I can't even come home sometimes. So just because I don't trust myself, I've become a script person. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right, one more question, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of switch screens. So go ahead and ask the question while I um, bring another document up here. Is there one more question or should I just jump here? 
ethnic um, or... I had a question about speaking in like a non-Christian setting. Yeah. Um, yeah. What would be a good way to, I guess, apply biblical principles in a way, um, yeah, uh, in still like a evangelistic way? Um, and then how would you kind of tailor to make something similar to a call to faith, but not actually like a call to faith, if that makes sense? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So on my website, so on my website um, um, can you that? We're gonna, mm -hmm. So on my website, tellthestory.net, on the front page, there's a message called the Magic Book of God. That would be a good illustration for you. And then also, if you um, jump over to the um, uh, Price of Life tab, there's another illustration there. And like I said, the majority of the audiences that I'm talking to are non-churched audiences who are, um, they're not accustomed to, to preaching. And, and in some ways, that actually is a blessing because they don't come with all of the assumptions about what you're supposed to do in a message. So like there's one message that I'm doing right now quite a bit where I break out into a spoken word piece in the middle of the message. And I'm not a spoken word artist, so it's just adequate. And, um, you know, the audience doesn't think anything of it because they don't know that preachers aren't supposed to break out into a spoken word, you know, deal. They don't know that you're going to take a break in the middle of your message for a video or, you know, pass out glow sticks or, you know, light some candles. They don't know that that's normal or abnormal. And so, so in some ways, it's actually kind of a cool thing. And so uh, there are a couple of illustrations. I want to end on time. And so I want to give you kind of an illustration on your screen. Is um, If you are a user of OneNote, you'll recognize this uh, interface. If you're not, you can use a pad of paper. You can do anything that you'd like. It doesn't matter. But when I start my process, my, my 24 to 32 hour process, I'm going to start by asking myself the high concept, the high level concepts that are derived from a passage. So here is some of the inductive study that I've done in the passage that I was preaching on, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1, and 5, 1 through 5. My primary passage was when the gospel came to you, it came not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and full conviction. So I'm doing my inductive study. I'm doing my, doing my hermeneutical process. I'm doing the historical analysis. And I'm coming up with these high level concepts. And what I began to realize was that Paul was actually talking about what I call two polarity dyads, word and power, Holy Spirit and personal human intervention or divine or a personal conviction. And so I built the entire message on the idea of and. And you can see this message on, on my webpage. It's called a both and gospel for an either or world. All right. So I'm just kind of showing you what's going on in the background. After I'm done doing my study, I'm going to write a summary of the passage. I'm going to write a thesis for that passage, an argument and an action, a, a point of action. Now, the audience almost never sees this. I don't say, now the thesis of my message is this. I just put it in there. Now, I might highlight it by you know, throwing it on, uh, on the screen or in their notes or something like that. My outline, and I wish we had more time to get into this, but in the old world, you would do an exegetical and a homiletical outline. If you, if you were an older person and you were raised in the church, you might recognize an outline like this. The inclusivity of God's family, the insistence of proclamation, the identity of God's power, the incarnation of God's family. It's an alliterated kind of construct where you're starting every single one of your principles with the letter I. Nobody preaches like that anymore, or they shouldn't. So if you're preaching like that, stop. Okay. So how you actually transition from a homiletical outline is through the principles in this book. This principle preaching book it's really an extraordinary um, way in which to convert your messages into culturally relevant, principle-formatted uh, uh, outlines. And so my principle outline is, an, uh, our either-or world is in desperate need of a both-and gospel. A both-and gospel changes everything. An either-or gospel is not a gospel of faith, but a gospel of fear. And so those were my three points in my three-point message. And I'm converting the homiletical content into these principles so that I'm capturing the entire text. I'm not leaving the text out. I'm just principalizing uh, my message. And then I move into my metaphors and my images. So I'm thinking of things like uh, refrigerator magnets, like the letter and. And I'm thinking about 
people using chalk drawings on the walls. And what I have end, ended up actually settling on with the event organizers was they it was a large denominational gathering. So they actually had printed pads of paper with the ampersand, the symbol for am, on those pieces of paper. And I was inviting pastors to say, if you're an evangelism only person at the expense of social justice, you have a word only gospel that's devoid of the power of God. And you need to come back to the idea, the power of hand, and embrace a, a gospel of word and power, right? And there were a couple of different ways that I did that. I gave them lots of illustrations. Maybe you're a person who isn't walking with God. Your intimacy is gone. You're very knowledgeable. You're preaching, but you're not really connected with God. You need to come back to the idea of hand. So that's kind of the metaphor and the image. And then my, my action or my point of faith was to actually have them write out what they were convicted by, what they needed to repent of, how they needed to return back to the idea of and, and then right there with other pastors to share those burdens, to share those concerns, to pray, to repent. And then there were some other aspects of the, of the larger program that fed into that. You can see that message uh, online as well. And so I just kind of wanted that there's, that's one of probably a few dozen illustrations that I could, I could have shown you, uh, but it's the most recent one. I just kind of wanted to show you how I organized that process in a OneNote file. So I'm going to close in a word of prayer, but before I do, are there any other pressing bird, uh, burning questions? And then here's my question for you. Um, just message me if there's any interest in doing this again, particularly around evangelistic preaching, looking at um, the theology of evangelism, looking at evangelistic proclamation, just message me either through Facebook. My email is york at tellthestory.net. You can email me there as well. But I'd love to hear how this experience was for you. So give some feedback. I'll actually do that um, through that message that I sent each of you. I'll actually ask for you to give me some feedback. But for the sake of time, I'm going to pray. But any other last minute burning burn questions? Because I want to make sure we end on time. Okay, great. Well, thanks for investing 90 minutes of your Monday uh, with us. And uh, I'm really just uh, thankful for you all as colleagues and friends. And I uh, just want to pray a prayer of blessing for us. Lord, I thank you for the sisters and brothers, Lord God, women and men that you've called to do the work of the ministry who are interested in learning and growing as communicators. And I pray that uh, elements of what I shared, Lord God, would find their way into their practice and craft. And that for the sake of the gospel and for the power of the word of God, that you would use us in this generation to do a mighty and great work, Lord God. We pray that many, many people would come to faith in Christ. We, Lord, pray that your word would be proclaimed. We pray that lives would be transformed and campuses, Lord, would be renewed. Pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks, Jordan.